Okay, hello AP English Literature class. Um, for the final, we talked about putting a poem on the final exam that you might not have seen before um, and that you would get a set of questions that you had never seen before. And the purpose of doing this is to kind of get you thinking on your feet the way that you would for the AP exam. But because we aren't quite to the point of taking the AP exam, I'm trying to stage your introduction to what can be a pretty brutal exam um, by giving you a little bit of a review of a poem and, and then on the exam you're going to get the AP questions. Um, so if you follow along or go stanza by stanza through Percy Shelley's Ode to the West Wind. And um, I've got some little notes in the margins. Um, and everything I say will hint at an answer for a multiple choice question. So if you follow along with this presentation and you read the poem a few times and you make a point of understanding the things that I'm talking about, um, when you see the multiple choice questions on the final, and you should be well equipped to answer them. Okay, so there's uh, five stanzas, and they are each in this form, which is called terza rima. And if you count up the lines, there are 14 lines. And if you know anything about Shelley from last year, we did read his poem Ozymandias for Brit Lit. Um, he was interested in playing around with the sonnet form. So this is a sort of sonnet. Um, you can check out the rhyme scheme and know that every sonnet that he is writing for each part ends with this couplet and there is a rhyme scheme here which I'll leave you to look at. So let me read the first stanza. O wild west wind, thou breath of autumn's being, thou from whose unseen presence the leaves dead are driven like ghosts from an enchanter fleeing. Yellow and black and pale and hectic red, pestilence-stricken multitudes, O thou who chariotest to their dark wintry bed, the winged seeds where they lie cold and low, each like a corpse within its grave, until thine azure sister of spring shall blow her clarion over the dreaming earth and fill driving sweet buds like flocks to feed in the air, with living hues and odors plain and hill. Wild spirit which art moving everywhere, destroyer and preserver, here, oh here. That's a big, long sentence we have here. And um, Shelley's quite the wordsmith. What is he talking about? Okay, beginning with the first thing here, we see an apostrophe which is the direct address to um, something that's non-human. In this case, he's looking at the west wind, or he's addressing the west wind. And it's the breath of autumn's being. Okay, a part of a whole, the breath, is a metaphor to describe the wind that comes during autumn. So that would be a synecdoche, apostrophe synecdoche, two things we see immediately. So he is saying, uh, to the west wind, uh, he, he's invoking the spirit of the west wind by discussing how powerful it is. And actually it's appropriate to this time of year because um, we have a lot of leaves flying around, yellow, black, and pale, and hectic red, pestilence-stricken multitudes. Okay, the west wind is what blows the leaves off the tree. It's what blows winged seeds. Um, into the ground where they lie cold and low, like a corpse. And what do the seeds do? They wait for springtime, the sister of autumn. Springtime wakes them up. Springtime blows this trumpet, a clarion is a trumpet, over the sleeping earth, the earth that's dreaming during wintertime. And, um, and then everything revives with living hues, etc., over the plain and the hill. 
wild spirit, which art moving everywhere, destroyer and preserver, hear, oh hear. So he wants the West Wind to listen to him. Calls it the destroyer and preserver. Okay, it destroys things, um, the leaves, it blows all the dead things away, it sort of clears the way, but it also disperses things like seeds, preserving them so that they could be reborn again. So we have here a paradox. Important to notice the imagery, um, to notice how imagistic this stanza is. Um, there's images, um, well, I'll let you look at the types of images there are, though. It's a lot of nature imagery and a lot of comparisons. The wind is compared to a plague, a charioteer, a sorcerer. Um, who is the trumpeter? Um, the trumpeter is the clarion of spring. Spring is the trumpeter. So, important to know all these different comparisons being made in this stanza. Stanza two, thou on whose stream mid the steep sky's commotion, loose clouds like earth's decaying leaves are shed, shook from the tangled boughs of heaven and ocean. Okay, so in this section here, not only are the leaves being blown apart, um, the west wind is bringing storms and clouds, um, the tangled boughs of heaven and ocean. Um, it's using tree imagery to describe um, the sky and the ocean. Um, another word for tree imagery would be arboreal imagery. And another word for imagery that is associated with the sky is celestial imagery. So here he's really making this sort of cosmic invocation of the power of the west wind, describing again um, its, uh, its almost supernatural power. Angels of rain and lightning there are spread on the blue surface of thine airy surge, like the bright hair uplifted from the head of some fierce minad. Even from the dim verge of the horizon to the zenith's height, the locks of the approaching storm. Okay. So he's describing a storm as a minad. What's a minad? It's um, one of the uh, mythological followers of the god Dionysus. And Dionysus was the god of wine. And the minads were these crazy, um, sort of wild-haired women that accompanied Dionysus when he entered into a village. And what would happen would be a mass frenzy. Um, and the festivals of Dionysus in ancient Greece were characterized by lots of drinking and a sort of discarding of the, of the, the social um, norms of the day, like anything goes during the festival of Dionysus. Um, so the wildness of the west wind um, and the storm brought in by the west wind are compared to the hair of these minads which were often depicted in the myth mythological um, writings as something that these minads were considered fierce, maybe scary, because they were so challenging to um, what was normal, um, overturning conventions, inviting chaos, inviting frenzy and ecstasy along with it. Um, so reading on ahead, um, Thou Dirge of the Dying Year, Dirge is a type of song, the dying year, okay, well, in autumn everything is dying and preparing for winter, so the year is dying in autumn, to which this closing night will be the dome of a vast sepulchre, sepul sepulchre is a tomb, vaulted with all thy congregated might, of vapors from whose solid atmosphere black rain and fire and hail will burst. Oh, here! Okay, so again, he is apostrophizing Oh, here. He wants to be heard by the west wind. So we want to ask, what is it that he wants? Okay, stanza three. Thou who didst waken from his summer dreams, the blue Mediterranean, where he lay, lulled by the coil of his crystalline streams, beside a pumice isle in Baiz Bay, 
and saw in sleep old palaces and towers quivering within the waves in tensor day. This is a difficult line. Um, the quivering within the waves in tensor day describes um, a reflection um, that you see when you look into the ocean um, from the point of view of the Bay of Naples. Okay, the Mediterranean in summertime, I guess, is, is laying asleep, and now the fall has come, it's woken up by these storms. And it goes down into the depths of the ocean, all overgrown with azure moss and flowers so sweet, the scents faints, picturing them. Thou, for whose path the Atlantic's level powers cleave themselves into chasms, while far below the sea blooms and oozy woods, which wear the sapless foliage of the ocean, know thy voice and suddenly grow gray with fear and tremble and despoil themselves. Oh, hear. Okay, so the West Wind's power goes all the way underneath the, the Mediterranean Sea, deep into the Atlantic Ocean. It's sort of this element that permeates everything. Um, so he's developing again more of the power of this West Wind. What does he want the West Wind to hear? Again, with the apostrophe here at the end. Okay, so here we see a little bit of a shift in the tone. If I were a dead leaf, thou mightest bear. If I were a swift cloud to fly with thee, a wave to pant beneath thy power, and share the impulse of thy strength only less free than thou, O uncontrollable. If even I were as in my boyhood, and can be the comrade of thy wanderings over heaven as then, when to outstrip thy skyey speed scarce seemed vision. Okay, so he is asking, what if I could be one of these leaves that you're scattering? What if I could ride on the power of your wind? Um, what if I could share the impulse of your strength? Only be, you know, knowing that I'm not as great, but only less free than thou. Um, placing himself in a smaller position of power than the West Wind. He just wants to be somewhat connected to it. Um, he remembers in childhood how he felt like he could be a comrade of the West Wind. And through imagination, he could outstrip the skyey speed of the West Wind, which scarce seemed a vision, which in other words means didn't seem impossible. That was as a child. I would never have striven as thus with thee in prayer in my sore need. Oh, lift me as a wave, a leaf, a cloud. I fall upon the thorns of life, I bleed. Okay, so this describes this sort of process of, of growing up. Um, he wants to be lifted up, expanded, he falls upon the thorns of life. Um, pain, suffering, those come hand in hand with existence. This is a reference to um, the myth of Icarus, who fell. A heavy weight of ours is chained and bowed, one, two, like thee, tameless and swift and proud. <coughs> so there's a tone here of imploration. He's asking for assistance from the West Wind. I am going to stop here at stanza four um, and start a new recording for stanza five. So part two is coming up. <clears throat>